Dr. Colonel Cedric Layton and Military Analyst General Spider Marks. All right, great to have all of you with us. Uh, but uh, President Sarkis, really let me start with you. You were just in Kiev. You've been there all week. Uh, what do you see on the ground? Are you surprised to hear this at all? No, I'm not surprised. Actually, when in 2008, Georgia was invaded by Moscow, uh, you know, mm -hmm. by Russian army. Uh, I was warning them, I was warning prior to that invasion that first Georgia will come and then Ukraine will come. That's the Putin is pro following his blueprint all the way through and actually uh, it coincidentally it happened both times during the or around the time of Olympics. Then it was Beijing Olympics and now it's Sochi Olympics. And actually the blueprint is exactly the same as they applied in Georgia. The same scale, this kind of so-called unidentified troops that basically are regular, regular mm -hmm. special units of Russian army. We've seen them and we know them very well. We know their handwriting. It is exactly the same thing. And we are talking right now about full scale, basically full scale uh, legally and technically for full scale military invasion. That's all it is. I mean, they will gradually build it up. It's not even based on some mass scale local movement. So Putin is not even disguising it anymore. We are right. talking about 20, in 21st century invasion of 45 million people and country as a response to, to, to a democratic revolution that got rid of a bloody tyrant that fled to Russia. And I just, I'm just as you're speaking, uh, President Saakashvili, the, this news is just coming in. The House Intelligence Committee Chairman Mike Rogers has just put out a statement that's very significant for people watching around the world tonight. Quote, it appears the Russian military now controls the Crimean Peninsula. This aggression is a threat not only to Ukraine, but to regional peace and stability. Russia's latest action is not a, yet another indicator of Vladimir Putin's hegemonic ambitions threaten American interests and allies around the world. But obviously another development there that this is not just a few hundred troops, or if it is, they control now the Crimean uh, Peninsula. Let me bring you in on this, uh, General Marks. What does that mean? Does that change the game here? What does that mean for the United States, where the president has just said today that there will be consequences? Aaron, the real issue here is that Crimea is a part of the Ukraine. Um, the citizens of Crimea enjoy no additional uh, sovereignty, sovereignty rights uh, beyond what Ukraine would, although the Crimea tends to lend, lend itself and its support and lean in the direction of Russia. That's Technically irrelevant. Sure, right. Well, that's irrelevant in this case because they're citizens of the Ukraine. And so what, let, we need to call it what it is, which is an invasion of one sovereign nation of another, irrespective of how Putin has done it, either at a lower level and now with the threat of some additional forces. Yeah. So, Colonel Layton, what does this mean, though, for uh, for the United States? It says that there's going to be costs and consequences if the Crimean Peninsula, which is part of Ukraine, has now been invaded and is now controlled by Vladimir Putin. Well, I think, that, Aaron, it's going to be a situation where if the United States really wants to stand up to uh, the Russian invasion of the Crimea, then it's going to have to do something, and that could include economic consequences. For example, there could be such a thing as an embargo against Russian oil, mm -hmm. uh, against Russian natural gas. That would have significant effects on Europe and would have to be coordinated with NATO. But those are some of the things that we could do short of military force in a case like this. So, so as President Saakashvili, how bad could this get? When you were, when you were president of Georgia, uh, hundreds of people were killed. Tanks came in. Troops came in. I mean, is this just the beginning for well, Ukraine? The, 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 I think it's just the beginning. And actually, last time, some people were trying to argue that it's irresponsible behavior of Georgia that provoked it. Well, what would you say this time? I mean, this is a pattern. And Vladimir Putin is following his pattern no matter who does what. And actually, the, and the, real, the reality is that, you know, the, it very much is reminiscent of what happened in the 20th century, very much like, you know, Anschluss of um, the Sudetenland by then Nazi Germany, but, but, and then, of course, the way how a big complex started in Europe. Now, this time, exactly the way how back in that European powers had responsibility for Poland, uh, the United States, the, U the United Kingdom, and by the way, also Russia, together pledged to guarantee territorial integrity in 94 of Ukraine in 1994 That's when right. Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. So there is a treaty obligation that the Western powers should have, have for this not to happen. Now Russia blatantly violated its own treaty obligations. So basically we are talking, I mean all the way through Western powers have been repeating there is no more Cold War. Well first of all there was always Cold War for Putin all those time. Now, now we are really getting to really, really 
hot war in Europe. And this is an exceptional circumstances. Right. And when I'm talking about annexation, Russian Duma has just done a draft uh, that makes it easy to integrate other countries' territories into Russia. This is unheard of. We are talking about Europe, 21st century. Somebody's just coming and trying to... So you to think the, the, the analogy you just gave is a very powerful one. You're talking about Nazi Germany going into the Sudetenland. That well, you I mean, legally, legally, there yeah. is not much of a difference because this guy, Vladimir Putin, now goes into another big European country, its neighbor, mm -hmm. and wants to grab a piece of its territory. And in parallel, a Russian Duma is discussing law how to make this territory part of Russia. Uh, now, uh, I mean, this, this is, goes beyond anything that people could ever contemplate in this part of the world, that this is really, really serious stuff. Okay. Colonel Layton, could reply to what President Saakashvili is saying, though, and he's saying, look, that there's a treaty that it's violated. I mean, you know, the parallels here to World War II are pretty powerful. So what does the United States do if there's this treaty? If sit back and say sanctions, is that enough? Well, it should follow the, the tenets of the treaty, no doubt. And I agree with President Shalkashvili that there are certain treaty obligations that the United States and NATO have when it comes to protecting the integrity of the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Notice, though, that the President did not invoke those uh, when he spoke uh, this afternoon at no. the White House, nor has Secretary of State Kerry. And that indicates to me that the United States is not willing to go that extra mile. Uh, what would you say, Spider? You agree with that? The United States not willing to go that extra mile, and if so, to the to the parallel that, that President Saakashvili just gave, what does that mean happens next? Well, the parallel is very stark, and it makes complete sense. The yep. precedent has been set. Um, the United States clearly will not act alone, nor should it act alone. The initial steps right now should be what can be what can take place now, short of military action, that would be su su sufficiently convincing to Putin that he needs to stop what he's doing. We haven't demonstrated that we can do that. We certainly don't have any influence in the region. But we do have friends. We have allies. We have NATO. We have the ability to try to influence and wedge ourselves in there. Right now, the concern is that we have a waning level of influence, and it needs to be reasserted. And it's going to be very, very difficult for the United States to do that alone, nor should it. All right. Well, we're going to hit pause on this. We're going to come back in just a moment with much more of this conversation. Obviously, a significant question for the United States. Former head of the CIA, someone I spoke to about this with a very stark warning. We're going to have that. President Saakashvili will weigh in. We also have new backlash against Spike Lee. Are people now targeting his family's home because of his expletive-filled rant on gentrification? And a man in Mississippi declared dead and sent to a funeral. Back with us. Uh, President Saakashvili, let me ask you this question. Uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, according to House intelligence uh, officials here in the United States, controls the Crimean Peninsula now tonight. What will the Ukraine do about it? You've been in Kiev all week. You've been with opposition leaders. Are they able to fight look, back? Are they going to resist? Look, Ukraine is a very, very peaceful country. And these people were really trying to put the whole thing together. They really reached out to Russian speakers uh, in Ukraine. And it's, uh, I mean, and the east of Ukraine mostly joined this protest. So. There was no, even not even single pretext for Russians to try to do that. I mean, Russia. I mean, the, the whole thing is that they were trying to sell this story to the West mm. that we are there to protect minorities. By the way, exactly when we, I mentioned Sudetenland, one has to remember that that part of Czechoslovakia was inhabited by German ethnic Germans, and Germany came in to so-called protect. Russia invaded my country to protect so-called to protect South Ossetians, Abkhazians, and they also suffered because they also had to leave the territory because there was ethnic cleansing involving also those ethnic groups. So Russia. When you think it boots of force, it's exactly always the dictators that do that claim to be their own humanitarian mission. They always claim to be provoked, but this claim is not valid. Now, Ukrainians, I think they were trying to start, they just brought in new interim government. Uh, they, the whole thing was going very peaceful. I, I met with all the leaders so for the last several days, had long conversations. They had a very peaceful intention just to do reforms, carry out democratic changes, open up Ukraine towards Europe. That's exactly the things Vladimir Putin cannot forgive them. He is going there because if Ukraine goes democratic, normal, European, uh, like open society, then every Russian will ask Vladimir Putin why we cannot have the, it's the same Russia. He had the same problem with Georgia because Georgia was succeeding in its building a democratic society. He had to act on these false pretenses of pretending uh, of protecting some of our people. So, uh, what uh, Ukraine has, Ukraine, unlike Georgia, has considerable army. They have officers corps. So they will, they now, they, gave, they gave up nuclear weapons, but their officers are very good. And uh, by the way, considerable chunk of officers in Russian army are ethnically Ukrainian. So, it's not so clear how Russians can force those people to fight against their own homeland. Hmm. So, the point here is we are really going towards that, that's the worst thing to think to get to the situation where we might get 
real war between two big European countries like Russia and Ukraine. And by the way, the Crimea also is a very important part for the rest of Europe. So, and then when we talk what the Americans can do, look, they're very short. I mean, you don't. Even if you don't send tanks, but whatever the treaty obligations are, but you can certainly expel Russia from G8. You can certainly send tax inspectors to American banks and international banks where all the Putin's generals and all his corrupt officials around him, including himself. Putin is the most corrupt guy in the world. He controls the biggest amount of cash that anybody had ever controlled. It can all be seized. It's doable. Yanukovych felt the very moment when European Union so, announced sanctions and his people started to defect him. So right, just well, don't send, send tanks at first stage, but at least send tax inspectors to Vladimir Putin's banks, accounts, yeah. and, and basically expel him to jail G from G8 for God's sake and, and, and other sanctions will be adopted because, you know, I've heard President saying he will have, it will cost him. I've heard this said, have, said by also previous administration up to Georgia's invasion. Well, did it really cost him? If it had cost him, he wouldn't have done now Ukraine. He is on a rampage, knowing exactly and or thinking and that he's, 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 he will kick an act without impunity, with impunity. Colonel Layton, to what President Saakashvili just said, that there were no repercussions the other time Vladimir Putin did this, I wanted to play with the former chief of the CIA, uh, General Hayden, just said to me. Here is General Hayden. He's gone into Georgia in August of 2008. He took South Ossetia. He took up Kazia. He still has them. And, and importantly here, Aaron, he really wasn't punished for that. I mean, that took place in August of 2008. By January of 2009, we have a new president. And there is no time in the penalty box for Putin with the new president. It's all about reset. Right, reset, it? be friends. Yeah, and so he got to do that and really didn't suffer too many adverse consequences. Colonel Layton, is that what is the problem right now? Is the world now suffering from the fact that Vladimir Putin invaded uh, Georgia and South Ossetia and had no consequences? Absolutely, Aaron. And the, really, the historical analogy can be brought back even further than the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. It can go all the way back to the Rhineland when Hitler invaded the Rhineland in 1936. Same exact things happened. And because there were no consequences for Hitler, the rest is basically, as I say, history. World War II started the way it did, and it became a real imbroglio for all of the, of the Western world. And this could happen again in the Ukraine. I hope it doesn't. But we have a real situation where the Russians are going to look at uh, the excuse of protecting their ethnic minority, their kindred spirits in the Ukraine, in the, the Crimea especially, and in the eastern part of the country. And that is where they're going to use that excuse, and they're going to try to kowtow, and the Ukrainians kowtow to them when it comes to this kind of a political situation. And it's a, a very dangerous situation right now. General Marks, will this become a, a, a war? Will that become an appropriate word to use? I don't think it'll become a war. Um, what we're really seeing is Putin really doesn't care at all what we say or what the international community says. He's very, very much in tune to what we do, what we demonstrate, and there are a number of things, as we've discussed, economic, financial, and diplomatic, that should be the precursors before any type of military action. However, simultaneously, mm -hmm. the United States should be in the United Nations, in NATO, and galvanizing an international body that is prepared to take action to isolate and to try to narrow this uh, challenge that we have. But we have to paint it the way it is, which is, an invasion of one foreign country into another. Now, the, the Russians have a really strong case for the Crimea because they have an agreement with the Ukraine. That's where their Black Sea fleet is located. Right. Sevastopol is the only so, warm water port that Russia has. Every other port in Russia...